All right, it's John Reed. I'm rejoined by Brian Summer. And we're here with the <laughs> Halftime Report. That's right. It's halftime in the busy conference season. Once again, it's spring 2018, and all the major contenders are still running out there right now. Well, How about actually, it, they're, I, as far as I can tell, there someone is on a stretcher, and they're limping towards the factory of the future. Oh, my God. <laughs> We've had a lot on the injured reserve list. And let me tell you, there uh, we have... We've got lots of vendors showing up at demos, but their idea of showing you a factory of the future deal is to bring in a 20-year-old barcode reader. I mean, get out of your chairs, folks. This is some exciting stuff we're seeing out of client sites on demos. You know, it's funny because for sports teams, it's about losing people to injury. For vendors, it's about screwing up your Alexa demo. <laughs> Cortana, show me my current account balance. How many failed Alexa demos have we seen in the last few weeks? Crazy. Every vendor's got one to share with us. And, yeah. And only one really had really great humor. And that was one we saw where the, uh, I think it was where the uh, in, uh, the Sage Cup showed up. Coffee mug oh, showed right. up. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, was At that the Acumatica, Acumatica show. Acumatica, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And they yeah. toss a Sage Cup aside. Yeah. That, was pr that was pretty funny. Yeah, we appreciate the humor there, folks. So the... We're just riffing a little bit, Brian and I. We're, we're at the IFS World Show. We just taped an IFS review, but uh, we're about halfway through the spring kind of busy season of the conference circuit. And humor aside, we thought it made sense to just put our heads together and just share a few things, trends that we're seeing and, and hot debates or topics that we're seeing across shows. And, and the limping to the factory, the future thing was, was one of them, but it ties into a beef that you have around ERP companies and, and their relationship to IoT. Do you want to say more about that? Well, I mean, you can't swing a dead cat in one of these shows and not have somebody want to bend your ear about IoT, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, natural language processing. Everybody thinks you got to pass an alphabet test uh, to get moved along into some kind of selection. Unfortunately, you know, talks one thing, delivery is something quite a bit different. And more importantly, a lot of these vendors actually are so full of their own hubris they think, and this is a related point, they actually think that ERP products are going to be the book of record going forward. Mm. Talk about dreamland here, folks. Mm. I mean, most of these ERP products were designed in an age of incredibly constrained uh, technology. They have 30, 40 year old data models that never imagined the kind of information coming out of. Uh, sensors coming out of unstructured data like emails and everything else. They never created, ever thought they would ever create applications for the kind of world that we have today. So I just had an interesting interview with the CEO of Datastax and I write about NoSQL here and there because I find the customer stories compelling. And what we were talking about was that, that it doesn't really make any sense. A lot of times I hear people saying, well, NoSQL is not ready for prime time. And you're, this vendor's not ready for prime time until I hear about rip and replace jobs with you pulled Oracle out and you put this new database in. And what we were talking about, the CEO's name is Billy Bosworth. We were talking about how I view it as more of a gradual thing where you're going to use some cool new tech, maybe it's NoSQL, to build a new digital app to connect to your customers, whatever you're trying to do quickly. You're not going to mess with your system of record, whatever they call it, as you as you just discussed. You're just going to move ahead. But what's going to happen over time, I think, with IoT and, and data, which is off, also going to be processed in the cloud as well, is the center of gravity just moves towards the cloud. And so to insist upon a system of record in-house is, is, I think, a little troubling when, when your data starts moving <laughs> where it lives in the cloud. What's left on-premise? Not very much. And yet we talk to a lot of customers at these show. I talked to one yesterday who was like, oh, we have no interest in cloud. And I'm like, well... <laughs> Things are changing, you know, so it's going to be interesting to see how people survive these transitions. Yeah, and okay, on that last point, I'll tell you, uh, depending on the show you go to, if you went to Dreamforce, 100% of the folks there, they're all in on the cloud, right. not to steal a Microsoft euphemism there, but, uh, and uh, same thing with a workday deal is somewhat of a, I guess, a selection bias, depending on who you ask. But by and large, I could tell you, going to clients, um, IT shop after IT shop has gotten a message from the board or the executive committee that they want IT focused on the development of strategic applications. They don't want them running and building and maintaining and managing data right. centers. They want utility computing and they want to get, and that's why so many of them are moving all their production load over to AWS cloud and those kind of things. Right. 
But the problem with IoT related projects being that you might claim that you're IoT friendly, but if it's not easy to connect cloud based right. data to your core systems, you're going to have a headache. I mean, you were investigating right. that just the other day, right? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, just because you're an EOP, ERP vendor and you have an IoT connector, whether you built it yourself or you licensed it or using it from Amazon or whatever, that doesn't make you a player in the IoT space. And you're exactly right, John, that the center of the universe, ERP could probably try and say it's still the book of record, but it's only for transactions, accounting transactions for the most part. And when you compare the amount of data stored in an ERP system, that's measured for even large enterprises. It's maybe a terabyte or two of data. But when you look at all the other data a corporation has, just look at what they've got in emails. It's probably in a petabyte level almost. Mm. And you look at text messages, you start looking at all the stuff coming, throwing off of sensors, the volume of data that a corporation has compared to how much of that is actually out of ERP is, you know, is massively different. And that's the direction where things are going. You're, you're exactly right. The data is not in the ERP system anymore. And that's where all the Hadoop processing, the in-memory technology and all the new stuff, all mm -hmm. that development efforts going there. And it's generally going in the cloud and it's not going in an ERP system. And shame on the ERP vendors for A, not paying attention and B, not building out solutions that could actually take advantage of all these new kinds of data and they didn't do it because it's not in their comfort zone and they don't mm. know how to do that yeah and and most erp vendors don't have a good api story yet either they don't have a good story about how it's easy to make these things interoperable and even before they even if they had a store it wouldn't do them any good because most of them never thought about i need to create mm. reusable libraries of right. tunable algorithms of tunable anomaly detectors of tunable workflows and everything else that needed to be part and parcel of the product to use all these new kinds of data and capabilities out there and if you had these reusable libraries well then that's what their partners or their own service arm or their mm. customers could use to really make these extensions happen but just saying I have an IoT connector customer. You have to find a way to come up with the, you know, the connector for all your different devices, whatever, mm. to then play nice with my one and only one IoT connector. That's nothing, man. And that's not even table stakes. That's an insult to bring that to the table. All right, now we're now we're now we're cooking. Some, yeah, you get now we're upset. cooking some brisket. <laughs> now we are. We got to cook it a little yeah, slow right, here. Let's run through a couple more topics. Uh, Another one I'm throwing out there is let's no more SaaS darlings. Uh, you know, there's certain SaaS companies that I think get an easy ride in the analyst and media world because let's be frank, they they brought in a fresh value prop for customers and 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 they you know their multi-tenant technology scales really nicely and all that stuff. Um, it's just another form of lock-in. It's still a three-year contract usually or whatever it is. Um, I don't think that's the ultimate future of cloud. I think the ultimate future of cloud is customer choice, interoperable components. I choose where I want to move my workloads. I, I put together processes that make sense for me. I don't think it's about three-year contracts, Brian. I really don't. Uh, admire your idealism, yeah. uh, John. Uh, you'd have made a great uh, poli sci or oh, something nice. like that professor in college. Excellent. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, you're... You're talking about something that runs absolutely contrary to the yeah. uh, to the Wall Street driven whims of the executive leaders of a lot of these uh, software companies. Yeah. Not only do they want you to sign a three year contract, they by the way they'd like you to prepay all three years in right. advance. Uh, and worse, don't even talk to them about already negotiating future price increases or anything else after the initial term expires because they'd rather wait and surprise the living daylights out of you after you've already got three years of solid built on built around lock-in things that are going to make it really hard to to switch away from that uh SaaS product on the you know it it it's a tough time out there yeah and i think what i'm saying too is not necessarily i realize that that the idealistic scenario I described, it might be a little too much for companies to deal with now. It's kind of like saying, well, let's break all these things down in a microservice. It's just like he wants to m manage that. No. But I think what I'm just saying is let's let's problematize everyone and let's let's not give anyone the easy way out or 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 preordain people as mark as as market visionaries. Let's put everyone through the ringer. That's all I'm saying. Well, fortunately, I think we got a couple chips off your shoulder, which should help you to squeeze into your. Uh, 
coach class airline seat that you're about to get oh, on. Groan. <laughs> so um, before we wrap up, maybe just on a, on a high point, because we have definitely uh, sort of shared a few sort of frustration points. Are there any things you're excited about right now? Any vendors not that aren't your clients that you're excited about that, that you think people don't know about? For example, you mentioned, I think, a couple... You mentioned Era, Era Technologies a couple times. You and I have both done pieces on them. Yeah. You mentioned, I think, Up, Uptake? Uptake, yeah. I would say Uptake probably uh, one of the most little-known, big, and impactful tech companies out there. And in the same breath, I would recommend people also look at uh, C3 IoT. Tom Siebel's got money in that one. Ray Lane has money in Uptake. Uptake is a double unicorn. They're, they have an over $2 billion valuation. They have just been killing it out there and creating an alternate way of looking at how value can get created with enterprise applications. If you're in uh, any of these asset intensive industries, you really owe it to yourself to probably talk to them. And I'm not, I'm not under any kind of anything to pitch any kind of vendor. And you sure. know me, I'll talk smack about it, all of them, good, yeah. bad, and otherwise. That's one I think they had an analyst deal a few weeks back, and they had. Um, They've got a really good. They got a really good story. So, before we wrap, just on that point, it's easy to talk the good talk. So, how how is it that this one actually, where when you go to a day like that, how is it when a vendor gets across to you that it, they're really making a difference versus just t you know throwing up some cool looking slides? Like, what was the difference for you that said, yeah? I got to track these folks. So they have all these like reusable libraries of uh, algorithms and everything else that I was talking about, analytics, uh, widgets for their dashboards and a million other things. And they have all these connectors that will connect to all kinds of IoT and other type of devices to suck data out of a company's um, uh, technology mm -hmm. world. Here's what's really fascinating is for the typical customer that they'll sign up within two weeks they've already started providing them analytic uh, uh, insights and are already delivering value to show them exactly how much money they can start saving now right so where an erp implementation might take you a year year and a half two years or more these guys are freaking delivering value in just a couple of weeks and it's because of the reusability of the you know and the way they built their products, if you will, to have such great reuse quickly. So taking advantage of diverse external data sources, uh, intelligent automation features, and quick implementations are, are some of the core things that are Yeah, resonant. I'd add to that very deep uh, subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. And th those guys probably have half the data scientists in the Chicago area work for uptake. Mm -hmm. They got the horsepower to make it happen. And I would simply add, you know, put your customer stories out front. I mean, I've had to dig for some of the better stories I've found, and uh, I think vendors still need to let their customers do their talking, and that's always good to catch the stories. In fact, I have another interview in just a few minutes with the customers. Look forward to that. Any final comments? No, I got I got one of those uh, lovely scrub class back of the plane uh, airplane nice. seats to go crawl into here. So, you know, I'm waiting for the major carriers to start bringing uh, chiropractic as a service, you know, mm -hmm. on every flight domestically in the U.S., you know, uh, for poor Well, I don't folks think you're going like to get that, but what I do want to tell you, which you may be happy about, is as your parting gift, I brought you an emotional support animal, which yeah. I'll now present well, to you. My, oh, my support possum, huh? <laughs> yeah, I brought you a possum. Enjoy, Brian. All righty. Thanks, John.